Hey, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's time for another of these live events. It's been a while since we did our last one, I think uh, three weeks ago now. Um, there's been a few changes uh, to the schedule. Sarah Krieger couldn't be with us tonight. She's been called in to do a series of extra night shifts. She's really been working hard out there. I know lots of people have. Um, we were going to do some stuff about COVID is not um, seasonal flu with Dave Schreiger. That actually went out as audio on Monday, so we're not going to do that uh, right now. And there's a lot of uh, other videos that we're going to show tonight in longer form that we'll post in the next day or so. Um, I also want to shout out to Jenny Beck Ismay, who is in the chat room. So if you're chatting, we're going to be taking uh, the, some of those questions and I'm going to be able to get those and we'll answer them as the show um, goes. But before we begin tonight, um, you know, the elephant in the room is that we're about to be on curfew and shutdown here in about an hour, and my wife said, what are you going to say about all this stuff that's going on? And initially I was going to say, I don't know what to say, and maybe this is the time to shut the hell up and listen. But it seems sort of disrespectful to the moment to not say anything. So let me try and say a few words. 28 years ago, um, there was a pandemic, and it was the HIV pandemic, and we were afraid and we didn't know what to do but we went to work anyway. 28 years ago, there was a video that showed this incredible brutality and Los Angeles exploded with violence and protest. And I was driving to and from home through those fires and I was scared, but I thought, well, at least this will result in change. Fast forward 28 years and there's another pandemic, a different pandemic, and we're afraid and we don't know exactly how this is gonna pan out. Fast forward 28 years and we see another incredible act of brutality and it's just incredible that people could do this and somebody died. And of course, again, cities across the United States and now across the world have exploded with violence and sadness and during this time you think there's no reason to hope. After 28 years, nothing changed. But I do have hope. And I'll tell you why. There's two reasons I have hope. And the first one's a paradox. And the paradox is that this feels worse than it did in 1992. It feels worse. And the paradox of that is that means that there is more energy for those people that want change. More energy for those people that believe that we are created equal and that we should be treated that way. More energy for people who believe that we should have health care for everywhere, everyone. That the playing field should be leveled out if not flat, leveled out much more energy than there was in 1992. That's the first reason that I have hope. I think that uh, this is a moment and we are going to seize it. And the second reason I have hope is because of you, because of you in the emergency department, because during a pandemic, when people are short of breath and they're dying, they come to you and you're afraid, but you go to work every shift and you save those people. And I've hoped because of you, during this violence, there'll be injury, and where do those people go? They go to you, in the emergency department. You're there 24-7, 365. You look after these people if they're black or if they're white, if they're old or if they're young, if they're rich or if they're poor, if they have insurance or if they have no insurance. So if you need some hope, if you need some inspiration, you need to look no further than your colleagues. You people are amazing. You've done it 28 years ago and you're doing it again. So if, like many of us, you need hope and inspiration, know that we do what we do because of you, the heroes of emergency medicine, and you're at it again. I want to just show this uh, slide to remind you that um, the Covered Project is going on right now. Dave Talon put this together with the CDC. Uh, I think Dave uh, and the co-investigators got $5 million. This is going to be following healthcare workers to see what are the risks um, of developing COVID as a healthcare worker. So we're very proud of the work that Dave has been doing. He's not going to be joining us um, this week. Here's all of the things that we're going to be talking about, but let's start off with um, a quick review of what we know. It's been three weeks, and we've been in this thing a number of months now. So we got together with uh, our fellow Brit Guest, um, to sort of summarize where we're at right now. So what do we know, or at least what do we think we know, and what don't we know? And I'll be doing this with Britt Guest, who's our fellow at UCLA. Okay, so what we know, or at least what we think we know. 
COVID-19 was first detected in December in Wuhan, China. The R0 is about two to five, meaning if you get the disease, you're probably going to spread it to at least two to five people. It's spread via respiratory droplets and fomites. There's significant asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic spread. Many patients will contract the disease and not, just not develop symptoms for up to five days, even two weeks. COVID symptoms, typical, we see cough, nasal congestion, sore throat, fever, headache, malaise. People lose their sense of smell, shortness of breath. We've seen rashes, we've seen COVID toes, and we've seen quite a few cases of diarrhea. We're also starting to see the systemic inflammatory syndrome, which is causing neurological complications, thrombotic complications, as well as cardiac, and in kids, some syndromes that really look like Kawasaki's disease. In terms of mortality, the mortality appears to be about 0.3%. We won't know exactly what it is until this thing is over. And mortality is obviously much higher in the obese, in the elderly, those with comorbidities, and unfortunately, in those people who are in worse socioeconomic circumstances. And in the United States, that means people of color have significantly higher morbidity and mortality. Now, there's this idea of happy hypoxics, and Ruben Stryer was one of the first people to describe it early on in the disease. And it's really this profound phenomenon where the patient is very hypoxic. I've seen them 55%, but they're sitting there, they're talking to you, you look at them, they're tachypnic, but when you ask if they feel short of breath, they really don't feel very short of breath. They're not very symptomatic from it, or at least they don't think they're very symptomatic from it, even when their oxygen is in the 50s. In terms of testing, we know that pre-CR is pretty good, but there are false negatives, sometimes to do with how they did the swab. And there can be false positives. After you've cleared the virus, there still may be viral remnants that are out there that are turning these things positive. Serology testing, there are some good tests, but there's also a lot of bad tests. You have to know which one you have in order to interpret that test. We know that chest x-ray, ultrasound, and CT scanning on these people is really impressive. Some of the most impressive CT scans you'll ever see in terms of you know, inflammatory changes. And there is a variety of inflammatory markers that are sky high in these patients. So now in terms of healthcare workers, we as providers are not immune to this disease. We're not immune to the virus, and we're not immune to the psychological effects that the virus has on our lives. Depression, anxiety, PTSD, these are all very real. Low risk areas, we're also not immune to the financial burden that this has caused. Places like New York were hit so hard, but in places like California, a lot of our hospitals were running at very low census, and a lot of providers have lost hours and lost shifts because of it. We do know that good PPE worn properly actually works, and the risk of infection when you have a good mask, you have good goggles, gloves, gown, is pretty low. And if infected, we know that you do have some sort of immunity, but we don't know how long that immunity lasts for. ICU care is evolving. Initial reports of the mortality in patients that were intubated were 80, 90 percent. In fact, it seemed like intubating these patients was a waste of time. Although current reports are in places that are not completely overwhelmed, much more success. Now, the key to success was avoiding intubation as much as possible, proning. But the key, key thing, individualized care. Having the time to do individualized care, we've heard that a lot from Sarah Craigan. Now, unfortunately, we know that there's no magic treatment for this. There's been a lot of medications looked into. We thought hydroxychloroquine was going to be this magic cure, but unfortunately it's not. And we're starting to see that mortality is actually higher when you use hydroxychloroquine. Now, there is remdesivir that does show some effect. It could speed up recovery, especially used in the first 10 days of symptoms. And right now, it's the only FDA-approved treatment we have. In terms of vaccines and returning to normal, it is possible. It is possible we will have a vaccine by the end of the year. And it is possible they'll be able to ramp production of this to the point where a lot of people will be able to get this vaccine. But if that happens, we need to keep this in perspective. If that happens, it will be one of the greatest achievements in medical history to date. It's a huge, huge lift, and there's no guarantee that's going to happen. What we don't know is so long, but here is just a few of them. This is actually an image, the first image of a black hole. We don't know what's going to work in terms of treatment, in terms of prevention. 
We don't exactly know how to ventilate these patients. We don't exactly know how to prevent intubation or when exactly we should intubate. We don't know how long immunity will last. We don't know if this is going to become a seasonal thing. Will a second peak occur? Will it be worse? Will it mutate? Will it get better? Will it get worse? Will this become part of the seasonal virus mix? Are we going to have to deal with this year after year now? How much of a lockdown is appropriate? Some lockdown now is appropriate, but too much can result in just as many medical and economic problems as if we don't. But how much? How do we dial those two things in? And there's a million more questions. But that's a quick summary of what we know, or at least what we think we know, and what we don't know. So actually, Britt and I recorded that on Friday, and already things have changed, because in COVID years, every day is about 30 years. Um, before we go any further, let's lighten the mood a little bit, because we need to. Uh, let's do another of those words that Stuart uses that you don't know. It's time for another words that Stuart uses that you don't know. And today's word is platypnea, which in Australia means to look like a platypus. In the rest of the world, apparently it means to be short of breath when standing or sitting upright unlike orthopnea, which is shortness of breath when lying down. Obviously very important during these proning times. Platypnea. That's right. You look like a platypus too. Oh, and that is an excessive number of screens, and they all have MRAP on them because I've got a problem. So the Corpendium chapter is getting used a lot. Tell us what they are. So a lot has changed in terms of COVID that we've added into the chapter that we are trying to push out translations of the COVID chapter. So we already have Spanish, French, Portuguese, Japanese, and Farsi, and several more are in the works. So be on the lookout for those. And okay, so here's some of the highlights of what's changed. We're learning more about the dermatologic findings that you might see with COVID. Some of the derm findings fall into the vascular lesions category and some are just nonspecific. Some of those vascular dysfunction lesions, one of them is called COVID toes. We have a picture of that in the chapter and it looks like pernio. You can also see it in the fingers. Um, other findings related to vascular dysfunction, purpura, palmar erythema, livido reticularis, and acrocyanosis. Some of the nonspecific findings that have been described include pityriasis rosea. Um, some lesions that look like folliculitis or zoster have been described, urticaria, and maculopapular rashes. So all sorts, just a whole array of dermatologic findings that are unclear why they're associated with COVID. We've added some more about thromboembolism and right heart strain. There's a lot more coming out about this, and I think a lot of discussion to come about uh, when to anticoagulate someone, but it looks like there is this really uh, significant association here. So just to mention one of these studies, there was a small retrospective study from Mount Sinai Morningside Hospital in New York, and it showed that right ventricular dilation was present in 31% of their COVID patients. Of those, some of them went on to get a CT scan, and many of them actually had pulmonary, pulmonary emboli. An update to testing as well. So the PCR testing, that can remain positive for many weeks um, after symptoms have resolved. And it's unclear why that's happening. It's unclear if someone who's getting retested is infected again, or if maybe there's sort of a mixture of false positives and false negatives that make it look like they're testing positive and then negative and then positive, or maybe they're just positive all along for several weeks. But anyway, it does look like this PCR test is likely to remain positive for several weeks after you're completely asymptomatic. Co-infection. So an update to co-infection rates. We had been saying for many weeks in the chapter that co-infection rates are considerable. It's unclear exactly what they are, but we've known for, for uh, months, we can say months now, you don't have COVID. So um, actually, if you have COVID, just like with any virus, it's likely that you can get a secondary infection and that can make you quite sick. So there was a study done in Wuhan that showed that 50% of their patients who died had a secondary infection and most commonly it was a bacterial pneumonia. Now, there are a number of updates to treatments. There's updates to talk about in terms of remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir, ritonavir, and a little bit about zinc. I believe that we're going to be discussing that later in the show, but those are all reflected in the chapter, and you'll hear about it um, more from some of our experts on this live presentation. 
One of the really important parts about what we've been doing is talking about different parts of the country, different parts of the world where this virus is spreading. So I want to uh, go through our usual contenders about what's happening there. And you'll notice that the epicenter has moved from North America into South America. Nowadays, our numbers in TJ are going down. Um, it seems that the healthcare system isn't at capacity as how it was uh, two weeks ago. But now it seems that the epidemic has traveled to Mexicali, which is the, the, the next, uh, which is, um, I guess, east to TJ um, and just south to El Centro, which is in California. And um, over there, uh, it seems also that the healthcare system in Mexico seems to be at capacity, and they're seeing a surge of patients in El Centro, uh, which is in California. Um, and this surge is not is mainly driven by um, U.S. citizens who who live in Mexico. Just looking at the numbers, Mexico City also seems to be currently in its peak. Um, there are, again, what they did, uh, the, the, the strategy was basically to convert all of these tertiary, well, a few of the tertiary care hospitals and secondary uh, hospitals into only COVID-19 hospitals. Um, but uh, there has been some newspaper outlets that have described um, an increase uh, of deaths, for example, seen, in, seen by um, Funerary, funerary homes. Um, uh, so there, it, again, it's more of like anecdotal evidence suggesting that the that the impact or the magnitude of the epidemic is not well reflected by the numbers. Hi, I'm Rob. My name is Dr. Benjamin Washira. I'm an emergency physician based here in Nairobi, Kenya, and this is a situational update of the COVID-19 status here in Kenya. As of May 31st, we have 1,888 cases and 63 deaths, which uh, this is since March 13th when the first case of COVID-19 was reported here in Kenya. Uh, majority of the cases are in the two major urban areas, that is Nairobi and uh, Mombasa. But because of community spread, we're actually seeing a lot of COVID-19 cases across majority of the country, and many areas now have a case or two each. Most of the cases are asymptomatic and uh, very few people are admitted in hospital with COVID-19. And this is good. And this also explains why the reduced number of deaths in the country. Uh, the government has put in measures across the country in terms of lockdowns and curfews. But as of now, even as of last week, many people are back to their regular activities. Yes, we're all wearing masks, social distancing, hand washing, sanitizing. But activities are more or less back within the major urban areas, including traffic and uh, people going back to work. And even our ED numbers have actually started going back up. Uh, so it looks like a situation where people are more or less now living with the disease in the community and uh, accepting that this is not going to go away anytime soon. So that's the update as of now. And uh, great show. In Fresno, fortunately, we're still not seeing high numbers of COVID. Our county is up to about 1,300 confirmed cases and 17 deaths. Personally, I've only seen a couple patients who have had COVID, but let me tell you what I have seen that has been very heartbreaking and a real hit to the morale in coming to work. I have seen a lot of patients who have attempted suicide. I've seen a lot of ingestions. I've seen a lot of attempted hangings. Um, and I've seen a lot of increase in substance abuse. I've seen tragic motor vehicle accidents that I think are a combination of a lot of these things put together and the secondary effects of the social um, and economic implications of our response to coronavirus. I think that is a common theme in areas that aren't seeing a high burden of COVID disease, but are just experiencing all these secondary effects that may not have been anticipated. You know, what else I'm seeing is a lot of patients who... Are sad. It's sad. They're they're afraid to come into the ER, and they have waited until they have completed a stroke. They are waited. They've waited until their asthma is so severe that they need non-invasive ventilation and all medical therapy. They they have waited for um, many of their new or pre-existing conditions to get to a point that they need um, critical care 
or um, that it's too late for an intervention. And that's really heartbreaking. So I'd say the the morale has taken a, a hard hit. Um, in terms of PPE, there's good news there. I have always felt protected. We Maybe we run out of one type of mask, but another one's available. I've never run into a situation yet where I've needed to take care of a patient and I haven't been able to protect myself with appropriate PPE. PPE. So, so that is good news. So in summary, Fresno still not seeing a huge burden of COVID, but we are being hit hard by the secondary effects. Maybe two weeks ago, um, I thought that we were maybe going to overcome um, COVID-19 without getting like really overcrowded. But then about 10 days ago, I started to see so many patients in the ED, um, especially in the, in the county hospital where I work, uh, that wasn't, there wasn't a correlation with the numbers that the Ministry of Health was uh, publishing. Um, and then we jumped from, I don't know, 500 cases a day to 1,000 cases a day, 3,000 cases a day. And today we had 4,000 reported cases in 24 hours. Hi, everybody. Hi, Mel. Thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, for this report from the field. I'm speaking from Chile, and I, I, I have to say that during the last two, uh, three weeks, Chile has been through a uh, catastrophe in terms of health care with the COVID-19. Our, all our system is collapsed. Now, all our ICU, uh, mostly 98% of the ICUs in our region, are full of very, very sick patients. And this is, for our country, it has been a catastrophe, and we are all working hard to try to overdo all these situations. Right now we have like a hundred thousand people uh, with, the, with the infection and many more uh, at the hospitals. We are, everything is collapsed right now, so we're willing and praying for people to stay home now. Thank you, Mel, again, and you people for having me. Hey, I'm Rap Live. It's Jan Schoenberger coming to you from Los Angeles with a quick coronavirus update. Here in Los Angeles, the number of cases has been relatively steady. Uh, public health is reporting out about 1,000 new cases per day and anywhere between 20 and 50-ish deaths per day. And that's been holding steady for a few weeks now. Cumulatively here in LA County, which is a county of about 10 million, a little over 10 million people, uh, we have a total of about 56,000 cases and about 2,400 deaths in our county. Locally at my hospital where I work, we have seen a small uptick in cases recently. We admitted uh, about 30 new COVID positive patients to the hospital this weekend, which is a little higher than where we've been. We're at a total census of around 75 patients in the hospital right now. We are concerned here in Los Angeles for a surge. Uh, we have seen nice weather here in LA, a lot of people going outside, some reopening of different businesses, um, and a lot of action happening on the streets in LA, as many people have seen in the news. And that has led us all to be quite concerned about a surge in cases coming in the uh, weeks to come. That means that we're prepared, um, and we have left our tents out on our ambulance ramp, ramp despite the fact that we haven't used them, um, but we leave them there, occupying our entire ambulance ramp uh, for the most part with, with tent capacity should we need it. One of the challenges we're facing just operationally, which I know a lot of you out there are also facing, which is how do you staff an ED right now? You want to maintain surge capacity, but you also don't have the volume in a lot of places still to justify a full complement of shifts. On the other hand, you don't know when that volume is coming back. Could be quite soon. Who knows? So staffing is a real challenge, especially for places that staff usually more than one month at a time in terms of making a schedule. How do you make a schedule that accommodates for all of these different possible scenarios? And it's a real challenge and creates a lot of uncertainty in everybody about what their schedule is going to look like. So here in Los Angeles, things are holding steady. A lot of um, anxiety and anticipation for more cases to come. Uh, Los Angeles County is being labeled still as a hotspot in many of the media reports. Uh, and certainly we have not seen a substantial decline in cases. Now also to be noted that testing capacity has increased, which has to be balanced in terms of interpreting those numbers. So that's it from Los Angeles. Stay well out there, everybody. Wash your hands. Stay safe. See you later. So our update from the front lines is pretty much the same as it's been the last couple of times we've done this. We're probably about four weeks out of our big surge. I think New York is feeling about the same, talking to colleagues, and we're starting to empty our hospitals out. We've got more room in the ICU. 
we're also starting to get some real numbers. We're, we're now having time to look back and see what we've had over the last couple of months. And it looks like at our peak, we were admitting 80 to 90 patients per day for COVID-19. Our hospital has uh, 700 total beds and we were admitting between 80 and 90 a day. Our ICUs were filled. So about 90 patients in our ICU at our main shop and almost all of those patients were intubated. And we're we don't have final numbers on mortality, but uh, we're starting to get a little bit more reports. Actually, some of my colleagues just published yesterday in the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine about obesity and association with younger patients and severe COVID-19. So we're starting to actually be able to take the time and, and learn from what we've seen. And Mel, I think that the biggest thing that we are all finding now is the exhaustion, the mental and um, psychological exhaustion that is hitting us. And more and more of my colleagues expressing that difficulty. And at the same time, the trepidation about a second surge. And I think that's what we're most worried about. I think that's where everyone's really concerned as we open up more and our beaches are open in New Jersey. And is that gonna change and bring us back a, a huge flood of patients? And we'll have to see what happens over the next couple of weeks. But right now I can tell you that we are pretty low. My last shift, I only saw one patient with COVID-19 over 12 hours, which is pretty amazing. So I feel like we're back where we were in early March right now. And We'll see where to go from there. One of the big questions that we've had throughout all of this in my hospital and New York and all the other hospitals is therapeutics. And we've had some great therapeutic updates. I'm going to kick it over to Swad and to Sean Nort to talk a little bit more about any updates we've got on medications. All right. Uh, thanks, Swami. I'm here with uh, Sean Nort, and we've got some therapeutic updates for you, of course. Um, you know, uh, last time we were here, we had that little gimmick where we put uh, you'll remember arrows going up and arrows going down. And Jerry was uh, was among us. And we we were hesitant to give the remdesivir just a little tiny thin arrow up, but we kind of felt we had to. Um, and so this is our, our, uh, our, our opportunity to talk about that uh, now that we have data. Um, you know, we've also been uh, picking the data from these pre-publication websites um, and that's just, that's no good. Finally, now we have actual studies coming out and we'll be able to focus our, our attention on critiquing the articles that come out. And so we've curated a few for you. Um, and let's start with the, the Remdesivir uh, article. If you could just put that up, the, uh, the New England Journal article came out on the 22nd, huge deal. This is the one that uh, Dr. Fauci releases the uh, statement about saying that it was imperative that we get this data out. National Inf uh, Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease study that was double-blinded, randomized, controlled. Now they stopped it early uh, with uh, just over a thousand patients, about half in the remdesivir, half in the control group. Now, the, just uh, as an introduction to, uh, to Jerry, who's gonna comment uh, about it for us, who better, um, the main outcome that they were touting that led to you know, a massive supply of this drug going out all over the place and governmental response was an improved recovery time from 15 days in the control group to 11 days in the remdesivir group. No statistically significant, only a trend towards improved survival. So with that intro, uh, I'm going to kick it over to Jerry and he's going to basically give his, uh, his assessment of that paper. You know, I look carefully at this article and it, it is worse than I thought. And so let me just let me just say a few broad things. One is in general, uh, if there's one small study that says something's good, that doesn't mean it's good. So even if this study were pristine and everything about it were right, um, we should take that as, oh, that's promising, but not as, oh, it's great. And it's particularly worrisome that they stopped this early. Uh, you know, if it, in normal times, this would be a, a perfect um, drug company study, but this is a government study. It reminds me of the steroids for spinal cord injury, where they also felt like they had to push something that was great. And so they took this article that didn't prove anything that they said, and they pushed it and they sent us all letters. Some of you don't won't remember, those of you who are around will remember, we all got a letter personally from the government to tell us how great this was, even though the study didn't show that at all. In fact, there's some things about that study that are a little bit reminiscent of this study. I'll tell you about that in a minute. But in any case, so here's the government telling us we got something great, and they stopped it early, and it's the New England Journal, and oh my God, that's pretty powerful. And particularly in a time like this where we're 
reasonably desperate. We want to have something that works. So this is, is very, very powerful. So the first thing is, if this were perfect, it wouldn't prove what they said. It would just sort of give us something to hope for. And it, we'd need to test it again and hope that it, it was consistent. Remember, this is also a drug that has been uh, searching for a disease. Uh, everywhere it's been tried, it's failed, including uh, several viruses where it, it hasn't worked. So the if you were to think in a Bayesian way, you'd start out with, this is very unlikely to work. And a little bit of positive certainly wouldn't get you across the line, even under the best of circumstances. So anyway, that's that's the first thing. The second thing is there's a few things that are troubling about the way this is presented. Um, one is they stopped it early before they could tell us whether it actually made an important outcome. And we know that stopping early o always exaggerates the, the benefit statistically. It doesn't in every case, but it's likely to do that. The next thing is what was the outcome that was good? Well, the outcome was you got better quicker, 11 days versus five, 15 days. That sounds reasonably good. Although, how important is that? So what did they mean by got better? Well, actually, there were eight categories of where you could end up. You could be in the dead. You could be in the hospital on a ventilator. You could be in a hospital without a ventilator. Eight categories all the way to normal. Well, if you think about it, the outcome here was you weren't in the worst three categories. Well, did they test you weren't in the worst two categories? You weren't in the worst one category? You weren't in the worst five categories? I mean, there are many, many, there's thousands, eight factorial, the possible outcomes they could have tested. Was this the outcome they picked before they did the study? I don't know. I know it's the exact same thing in that spinal cord thing. They had multiple, multiple, endless numbers of potential outcomes. They picked the one cutoff, eight hours, where it seemed to have a p-value. They didn't pick nine hours. They didn't pick seven hours. They picked the one that worked. Is that what went on here? I don't know, but I'm willing to bet money that that's what went on here. So anytime, so a p-value of 0.05 is meaningless if you tested 93 possibilities, there's always going to be one that looks better. So this outcome, and forget about that for a second, is this an important outcome? What if in the top three categories you were four days faster, but in the top four categories you were worse? What about if, yes, you were four days faster, but in the key category of you were intubated, there was no difference? Or you were dead. There was, as in this case, there was no provable difference. So this is this is malfeasance. You're not supposed to do millions of possible outcomes and then only tell us the one that you think you'd like us to look at. So that's another really disturbing thing. And then <laughs> comes the absolute amazing thing. Look at table one. You know, you should always look at what did people like when they started? This is a randomized trial with the two groups equal. So figure one is what happened. That's an important figure to have. And table one is what did they look like? And there's all these numbers on here and it's, you know, and it's okay, you know, look. And if you don't look carefully, you won't notice that how did they do, how were they when they were entered into the study, supposedly randomized? I'm gonna say, okay, maybe they were randomized. But by chance, it turns out there was an interesting difference between the two groups. That people on remdesivir, 23% of them were in the ICU intubated. That's bad. In the placebo group, 28% were in the ICU intubated. 5.1% more patients were getting ready to die in the placebo group. 3% at the end were getting ready to die or died in the placebo group. Could you explain that difference by the fact that 5% of them were dying at the time they were entered into the study? How about 4% fewer in those three terrible categories at the end? Well, 5% were fewer before they started. Holy moly. Holy moly. Holy moly is right. 
Um, you know, you knew you knew where things were going when he starts off by, you know, it's worse than I thought. Uh, but Sean, what are your what are your comments? All hell the master, isn't it great to see Jerry out of retirement to review this paper? Uh, we, we've been bringing up our concerns about a, a lot of this data, and there was huge repercussions uh, after this with uh, doses for 140,000 people that were immediately available. Distribution was kind of this erratic going to small rural hospitals, had tons of doses, major academic centers with lots of cases, had none. Uh, we just have to see, right? I mean, but this paper, there's really not much to say beyond what Jerry said, but uh, there's much more data that needs yeah. to be found out about this paper and this drug. It just yeah, just amazing. It just it's so distressing when you think of the amount of resources and the amount of mobilization that will occur on the basis of you know a, a go ahead here. And so how we have to be so careful about that. It's just you know there's no going back once you once you pull that trigger. Uh, and speaking of that, let's move on to the next uh, slide and the next very important uh, paper for everyone to know about that happened on the same day. The Lancet uh, released uh, this huge uh, paper. Uh, it's a multinational data registry uh, trial on, on hydroxychloroquine, um, another uh, no es bueno, another negative study. Sean? Yeah, so, you know, we, uh, hydroxychloroquine, this is just amazing. The, the, what, people talk about this for years, this whole rollout of this drug and the treatment and uh, the errors that were made. But so this is a large study, as you mentioned, it's six continents, over 600 hospitals, large number of patients, 96,000, of which about uh, 15,000 either got hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine with or without a macrolide. And the majority of them, about 9,000, got hydroxychloroquine with or without a macrolide. And as you pointed out, this was a negative study. So it showed there was no benefit at all from any of these treatments, but there was an increased mortality, an increased risk of mechanical ventilation if you were treated with any of these combinations. Now, just like Jerry reviewed that other paper, this is a registry study. There's a lot of methodological question marks about this. I mean, there was really no big chart review. There was just kind of this da data crunch that went on to this. So uh, I know a lot of us, and I'd be guilty of this, are ready to jump on the bandwagon and say this drug is over and done with. And I still kind of feel that way. But I think we have to be metered about this data to really say, is it definitive? I can't say about that for this paper. Yeah, that's that's my impression as well. Is that you know I wanted to to uh, to say this was the death knell, but we have to be intellectually honest. The limitations and the concerns that we have here easily uh, could be uh, misleading to say. Let's just put it that way. And so uh, I think that the best way for us to say it is that we don't have we we still need our CT. We're still not there. It obviously doesn't look good, and you can imagine that. Uh, yeah, and that data may never come because the yeah. WHO actually uh, suspended their study. So I don't know that we're ever going to get any RCTs uh, on this drug. Uh, I, you know, I think that it's probably best to just move on. You know, I, as you said, I, I tweeted about this when it first came out, and um, a methodologist from Oxford said, and I was saying you shouldn't take this drug unless it's in a randomized trial. And this methodologist said. We shouldn't be doing a, a randomized trial because we haven't reached equipoise. There is no evidence that this works. Why are we even studying at all? I thought that was a little bit radical, but certainly uh, we shouldn't be using it outside of a randomized trial at the minimum. Absolutely, Mel. There's no, no debate about that. All right. Um, and so uh, that's that, <laughs> as they say. Um, now, next off, uh, in terms of papers, this is not a lot of now this next paper is not a lot of patients in here, uh, but at least it's something published about convalescent plasma that we can at least critique a little bit. Uh, this is a journal that most of you get uh, regularly, the Journal of Medical Virology, right? Um, and uh, what's what's up here? It's it's Tentatively, so the, promising. tentatively, but as you mentioned, it's small numbers. So if you look at it, it's a systematic review and it's done well, as some systematic reviews are usually generally well done. They reviewed a couple of databases, PubMed, Embase, uh, Medline, you usually like to see systematic reviews do a lot more databases than just those. But they identified 110 publications, but only got it down to five. And so you say, well, okay, five. But if you look at the numbers, it's only 27 patients, about half and half men and women. 
uh, all received of various other therapies. So, you know, there might, there's all these confounders that go to it. Uh, but what they did show in this was there was no deaths reported in any of their patients that received it. And there was both clinical as well uh, as viral load improvement. But selection bias, publication bias, small numbers, right? So all this stuff, but uh, I'm hopeful that we're going to start seeing more and more quality studies with convalescent plasma, but again, still early days. Right, okay. And so there is a few other agents that we had mentioned in previous sessions that we don't really have any more data, so there's nothing more to say, like the IL-6 inhibitors that there did seem to be some theoretical basis for them working in terms of this uh, the storm, the cytokine storm suppression. Um, one of the drugs that we haven't talked about, it's in the chapter um, that, uh, again, has some theoretical basis and maybe some promise uh, that we should mention is uh, Anakinra or Anakinra. Um, I'm pretty sure I went to grade school with her. Um, but I, I, I don't know. We're, we're... I thought it was a checkoff play. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, yes, exactly. No, it's whatever. So, um, you know that we love to do this, uh, these, these beautiful illustrations for one sort of featured drug. Um, and, uh, and Sean, just go through exactly why it is that these might work. So this is very much the same mechanism as tocilizumab or the IL-6. And if you look at this, a very busy diagram, but if you focus on that inflammasome, and that is really one of the key uh, portions of starting this whole cytokine storm, because then you get this enzyme called capsase that converts pro-interleukin-1, which is a equivalent to a pro-drug, into active interleukin-1, of which there's all these different isotypes that gets out and you have a massive cytokine storm. So that's the theory on interleukin-1. Now we've talked a lot about interleukin-6. The two big interleukins with COVID-19 are IL-6 by far, but IL-1 and the various types there. So this and is- And you wanna put the next, uh, put the, the uh, second slide up there because that shows you the- yeah, Perfect, you see, and there you go. Boils it down, yeah. Right, so you see the anakinra here. Uh, it's a receptor binder, right? So it sits on there and prevents IL one from binding on there with the theoretical benefit of cause, you know, preventing all those downstream effects. But this is immunomodulator. So we always worry about immunosuppression and maybe there are these untoward benefits from these interleukins that we are now hindering because giving these therapies. Right. And then uh, if you go to the next slide, you can see that uh, again, it actually the same uh, version of uh, Again, these these journals, the Lancet Rheumatology Journal, the same edition, uh, or sorry, the same month, there were two different studies that have both looked at this, but I take it that it's a bit of a conflicting picture. Well, it is a little bit. So there's one from France, and it's their data, and then there's another one from Italy. So I'll just focus on the, uh, the French study first. And so this was a retrospective cohort, and what they use is a historical control and then prospectively collected their their cases as they went forward but that's that's the model so there's always a little bit of problems when you do that they had a treatment group that got 100 milligrams q12 for 72 hours and then 100 milligrams every 24 hours for seven days totals of 10 days of therapy they all got standard therapy which at their institutions were hydroxychloroquine uh, chlor chloroquine with azithromycin they all were on some sort of antibiotic and also had venothromboembolus uh, uh, prophylaxis. 52 patients in the treatment group compared to 44 in the controls, and they did show that there was a decrease in both mortality and mechanical ventilation in the treatment group, but again, small numbers and uh, some of the adverse events, though. One of the things we worry with any of these agents is it can cause a transaminitis, and some of the patients actually were withdrawn because they had a transaminitis, and also there was increased PE and DVT and the treatment group, now we don't know if there was uh, from the anakinra, but that's something to consider. And both of these studies, and anytime you use historical controls, particularly with a new disease, you have to worry, am I just getting better at treating this disease over time? And maybe it's just that you're a better doc and you have better nurses and you're just more familiar that the intervention really had nothing to do with it. Uh, similar study, but as you mentioned, Stuart, a little bit conflicting. So this was an Italian study and they used similar dosages to the uh, uh, French study, but they also had what they called a high dose group. So that was five milligrams per kilo that they gave. Uh, and then they kind of uh, gave that over a period of time. What they showed is there was no benefit in that standard therapy. So uh, there was only seven patients, but because there was no benefit after seven days, they stopped 
that, that treatment arm. They had two treatment arms, high dose, standard dose of anakinra, and then the controls. But they did show that there was benefits very much the same. Survival was 90% in the treatment group compared to 56% in the uh, no treatment group. And there was less mechanical ventilation. But again, all the concerns of the historical control, maybe this was just kind of looking at this. So again, uh, interesting. This was a, an agent, as you mentioned, we hadn't talked about before, and we thought it's probably good to bring up since it is in the chapter. Right, right. So it's hard to know. It's hard to be too excited about that. Um, I think it's highly unlikely, like we've talked about, that the hydroxychloroquine story is going anywhere. Um, I thought it would be fun uh, and very non-scientific to ask Sean, because I have my own answer, and I want to see if it matches with mine. Um, of all the agents that we've talked about, all the ones today and all the ones that we've listed in the past, if you were allowed to get one, right, say they were all the same cost and only one was available to you, of all the things we've talked about, which agent would it be? Right. So if I'm in a lifeboat with 10 other people and I only have one drug, uh, convalescent plasma. That's where, give me convalescent plasma. That's where uh, I'm yeah. putting my money. And I wrote this down on, I wrote this down before I asked <laughs> Sean, when I asked him before to make sure that he agreed with me, because I think it's very, I, I think it's, you know, it's just unlikely that these other uh, agents, as interesting as all this stuff is, it's unlikely that that's going to be, any of them are going to pen out to be a silver bullet. Uh, whereas the plasma is still holding out a little bit of hope that that might be really, uh, really effective. So we'll see. Um, so thanks for that. Um, now, did you want to pause and take any uh, um, any questions on on uh, therapy stuff now, Mel? I don't see anything. Yeah, I don't see any specific the therapy questions, but let's take a few of these questions. Uh, first one's from Susie Demista. Wondering how close we are to herd immunity in New York City. The last numbers I heard from New York City is that there's only 14 to 20 percent uh, serologically positive. So um, for this disease, you're probably going to have to get to 90 percent uh, seropositivity to have herd immunity. So we are nowhere near that. That's why there's this great concern about the second wave. Um, this virus um, basically is ready to go again because it's just so low. And that's even worse here in California. The California studies have a less than 5%. Um, so at that rate, we're not going to have herd immunity for quite a while. Uh, another question here was about a rhabdo. Um, Hussein here is saying that um, he's seen three patients with rhabdo so far. Anybody had any experience with that, Swami? We haven't had any rhabdo. I will say I haven't been testing for it, but we've gotten a lot of urines on patients. Um, so I, I don't think that rhabdo has been something that we've been commonly seeing. Again, we have to kind of run our numbers and, and get a little bit more information, but definitely not something that I saw in our surge. Maybe another question for you, since you are the most experienced, having been through hell. Um, are you testing all inpatients at this point all the time just to do screening? Yeah, so we are. So if the patient's getting admitted, we have a requirement to get a COVID test sent on that patient. Uh, this is for cohorting purposes within the hospital. Um, and, and the biggest place that we're actually seeing is we have a lot of, um, we have a pretty busy uh, psych side of our emergency department. And a lot of our voluntary psych admissions are, uh, or involuntary psych admissions for that matter, are COVID positive, surprisingly. So yes, we are testing everyone who's coming into the hospital and I think that's a lot of that is in an effort to get the hospital back to some kind of normalcy, uh, getting elective procedures in, getting the ORs running again, which I think is really important just to keep our hospital system afloat. Rachel Hahn asked this question. I think this is really interesting. So how long should we keep wearing additional PPE if the surge has not been seen, wearing scrubs, caps, safety goggles, N95s, all shifts? Um, this is, to me, a fascinating question. For example, in Fresno, where we keep hearing there's not many cases, there are not many cases, and you're burning through this PPE. When should you stop that and say, okay, it's low enough that um, we should just sort of go back to normal times versus um, not doing that? The paradox here or the problem with this is that um, if you don't do that, your docs will get infected as the surge starts. And we saw this in New York and we saw this in lots of places. The first group of docs um, get sick because you're not wearing it all the time, but you can't really wear it all the time because you don't have enough of it and the surge isn't there yet. So I don't know the answer. One of the smart doctors here on the chat, please tell me, how do, what do we do? I think the minimum is a surgical mask. I think the surgical mask is gonna become normal for all patients coming into the hospital and for all of the staff to be wearing all the time. I think that, you know, we didn't have a lot of infections in our staff, either uh, nurses, PCTs or docs. And I think a lot of it was because we got masks on the patients coming in fairly early we're still wearing N95s, not everybody, but most of the time I'm wearing an N95 because we still have 
a steady flow of pretty sick patients with COVID, although not anywhere near our surge that we had before. And I'm worried that when that patient comes in, I'll forget to put an N95 on. I'll forget to switch from a surgical to an N95. So I just wear one the entire shift. Um, we've actually been talking about this on the chat a little bit. I'm going with the uh, same four masks that I've been using since mid-March. So I haven't used any new N95s. So I do one day on, three days off with my masks and I cycle the four of them. And uh, so far, so good. I haven't been positive yet. <laughs> that you know of, maybe you have. That I know of. <laughs> um, lastly, uh, back to therapeutics uh, since the civil unrest, and we're going to see a lot of other injuries, but specifically um, a lot of, uh, what's it called? Gas? Uh, yes, yeah, so I was going to say, it's, it's, it's the whole thing here is it's not really a gas. Yes, it's not a gas, it's, it's a powder. A, it's, it's powder, particles. So... Uh, we definitely wanted uh, to ask Sean, because so many of us are going to be seeing this uh, probably frequently, uh, unfortunately, what, what, just give us a practical rundown on uh, our approach to a patient coming with tear gas exposure. Yeah, so as you, as you heard, these are truly particulate matter. They're not really gases, but for all intents and purposes, we don't care too much about that. And there's all these different ones. There's CS, CN, known as MACE. Most people know that term. But what most uh, law enforcement use is what's called OC or oleocapsaicin, or really just think of uh, pepper, right, as uh, like pepper spray. And what these are, if you think about how they're meant to work, they're meant to cause retreat, and they're meant to last for about 30 to 60 minutes. So where are they going to get hit? Mostly in their eyes, and they're meant to get into the mucous membranes. So you're going to see people get hit and then retreat and go back. So what are you going to worry about? Where are you going to worry about those areas? You're going to worry about their eyes. You're going to worry about maybe any uh, um, mucus irritation, but that's usually pretty well tolerated. But some people might get bronchospasm. So if they come in, of course, always protect yourself because particularly the OC is in this uh, oil-based. And as you touch the patient, you could self-contaminate yourself. So you want to remove their clothes, and then you really want to focus on their eyes and just decon. And what can you use to decon? There's been loads of studies, and thus people have this anecdotal experience, water, saline, antacid, baby shampoo, milk. You know, none of them have really been shown to be better than the others. What we do at the Poison Center routinely is recommend milk, but that's because people have it in their refrigerator, right? And you can use copious amounts here, and it seems to give some symptomatic relief. But uh, you were telling me earlier, Stuart, about a study that you did and some of the findings that you had found. Well, actually, it wasn't, it wasn't a study that I did. Oh. Uh, it was a study that was, yeah, um, because, of course, part of the study was uh, involved getting sprayed with pepper spray and other things like that. So I, I wasn't interested in that. Uh, yeah. uh, no, but in all seriousness, um, well, there, you there had was mentioned study, the corneal abrasions, right? There was, yeah, there was a, a there was a huge, uh, uh, not a huge, but an eight percent rate of corneal ulceration in patients that had pe that were pepper sprayed in this uh, um, in this series that we we did, and so you know that that's that's a really big thing to think about. It, in these it, cases. I mean, there's is. a skin and there's the lungs, and we kind of know that, but if there's persistent eye pain, right? realize that. I mean, there's, yeah. there's a certain percentage of these people that actually have ulcers and that's going to require. Ongoing. Well, it is. So you only get ulcerations from a tox if with prolonged contact. And what that means is you can get abrasions because this is a particulate matter and people rubbing their eyes can even cause an abrasion. But if they have ulcerations, that means that they didn't get properly decon. So just copious amounts and then just do a really good fluorescein exam afterwards. And as you said, if they still have pain, you just keep irrigating them till they're pain free. All right, well, let's move on with the show. And we're going to bring in Eileen, Claudius and Swami to talk about uh, some PEDS updates. Yeah, so let's get into what we've got going on from the pediatric side. Eileen, we are so worried about these different syndromes that we're kicking up in the, in the media. There's some case reports out there, case series. What is going on with this inflammatory syndrome in kids? Yeah, a lot has happened with multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, aka hyperinflammatory shock, aka Kawasaki-like COVID disease, aka PIMS. We have a definition. We don't have any big studies yet, but we do have providers at hospitals that have seen 20, 30, 40 of these kids who can give us some guidance based on their observations and what they're doing. Now, hopefully, likely, none of us are gonna see more than a few kids who actually have 
this in hyperinflammatory syndrome. That having been said, the CDC does recommend parents coming in for common childhood illnesses like fevers, rashes, diarrhea. So we are gonna see a lot of parents who think that their children have it. And we do need to have a plan for what to do with those kids. So let's start with the definition. There have been a couple different societies that have put forth definitions. Probably the most widely used is the CDC definition. And that requires a child to be less than 21 years of age. They need to have had a fever for more than 24 hours. And that can be a subjective fever. So that's basically any kid with a parent. They need to have some elevation of their inflammatory markers and some evidence of clinically severe illness in at least two different organ systems without another plausible diagnosis. And they have to have some evidence of COVID, whether it's PCR, serology, or even a decent history of a COVID exposure. And all of these cases are getting reported. So what are these kids looking like now that we're starting to have a good idea of the demographics? They tend to be a little bit older than patients that we've historically seen with Kawasaki disease. Remember, this is sort of has some overlap with Kawasaki. They can be anywhere from age one to 21 years old, but the majority fall in the five to nine year age group. Slightly more males. It seems like blacks might be slightly overrepresented in getting this syndrome as well. And most of the kids have been previously healthy. We've seen a lot of cases in New York and David Dansky had written in earlier asking if that's because there's a different strain or what the reason is for that. I have to admit, I'm not completely sure, but this tends to happen between two and six weeks after initial infection with COVID. So my guess is that there are just more kids in New York who have had that two to six week time window to exhibit features of the syndrome. In terms of presentation, of course, a lot of that is going to be driven by the, by the definition. And so 100% of these kids are going to have a fever because that's in the definition now. But we're also seeing a lot, a lot of GI manifestations. One center reported 83% of their kids coming in with GI manifestations, mostly abdominal pain, also anorexia, vomiting, diarrhea, a little under half have had abdominal tenderness. And a couple kids actually got CTs because of the degree of tenderness and had kind of interesting findings of thickened bowel on CT or terminal ileitis on CT. Also a lot of rashes, and that's gonna to be tough for us. More than half of these kids have had rashes all over the rash spectrum, morbilliform rashes, the newly described chillblains type rashes. And the problem with rashes is they can happen anytime in the course of COVID. So they're not necessarily specific to a multi-system inflammatory syndrome. They could just be with the initial COVID infection and a relatively benign course. So a rash certainly doesn't necessitate a kid getting admitted, but we are seeing rashes with about 60% of kids who do have the hyperinflammatory syndrome. About half are gonna have shock, almost ubiquitously tachycardia, and really not as many kids with respiratory symptoms as you would expect somewhere between 30 and 60% with the minority of kids having tachypnea or hypoxemia. What's really important for us to know though, is more than half of these kids are going to have some type of cardiac dysfunction, myocarditis, arrhythmia, or like we see in Kawasaki, coronary artery abnormalities. Things that stand out from a laboratory standpoint, because when we see this undifferentiated population, we are going to have to rely not only on our clinical judgment, but on our labs. CRPs are elevated 100% of the time in a lot of case series, CRPs have been elevated, often really high, often above 30. D-dimers are almost uniformly elevated. Almost all the kids are gonna have a metabolic acidosis with a respiratory alkalosis, like you might see in sepsis and about half of them are going to have some type of EKG abnormality. We're also seeing AKI and transaminitis as well. So what are we doing with these kids? Well, a lot of them are getting admitted and being treated with IVIG, just like the Kawasaki disease kids, but a lot more refractory. So many kids are moving on to things like infliximab, pulse dose steroids, or the anakinra that you guys were discussing just a few minutes ago. In terms of knowing who's going to decompensate, who needs to go to the ICU, who you absolutely do not want to send to any area that isn't highly monitoring, monitored, the kids at high risk of decompensation 
are basically the ones with cardiac findings, elevated troponins, abnormal EKGs, or the ones with very high inflammatory markers, sky high ferritin, sky high D dimers, hyponatremia throughout COVID and throughout the other SARS epidemic with SARS-1 was sort of equivocal as to whether or not that was a risk factor for decompensation. But a few centers have cited that as a risk factor for decompensation for kids with the multi-system inflammatory syndrome as well. So what do we do? You have a kid come in, they have the fever, they've got a rash, some GI symptoms, maybe respiratory, maybe not. They have something else going on. Who do you work up and who do you not? And what do you do with them? That's the hard question. So the sick kids in a way are a little bit easier because they're gonna get the full workup. They're gonna get admitted to an ICU. A few tips on them though. Remember, a lot of these kids are gonna have myocardial dysfunction and a lot of them come in with GI symptoms. So they're gonna be really dehydrated and possibly even in shock. And you're gonna wanna give them fluids. Be judicious. These are the ones to do the 10 ml per kilo boluses and reassess cautiously. The other thing is pressors. With pressors, we really tend to grab for norepi if we feel like someone's in shock. Remember, a lot of these kids are in cold shock. So before you grab the norepi, just grab the kid's foot. And if it's cold, if the capillary refill is five, 10 seconds, go ahead and just grab the epi instead because kids in shock often, particularly with cold shock, do a little bit better with epi or norepi. For the kids who aren't toxic and come in with a fever, if they have anything else that would make you concerned, rash, GI symptoms, cough, headache, irritability, or certainly any of the features that go with Kawasaki disease, you're going to want to do somewhat of a workup. And what most people are recommending is a CBC, a CRP, D-dimer, ferritin, CMP, and a troponin. And if any of these are abnormal, the kid gets admitted, they get consultations, and they go on to the second stage of lab testing, which is basically everything. You might actually want to send serologies on these kids as well, because they're probably going to get IVIG and the IVIG is going to mess up the serology. So that would be a nice service to the inpatient team. If you can at least grab an extra tube for that. Now, the thing that's tough is if you send a CBC on a febrile kid, you're pretty much asking for an abnormal result. And so that's going to give us a very, very high admission rate. What one center has offered, which I think is what I'm going to incorporate into my practice, just because I really hate that CBC and I really hate having to listen to the results of that CBC, is to look mainly at the CRP, the D-dimer, the ferritin, and the troponin, maybe even throw in a BNP. And if any of those are abnormal, absolutely, I'm going to be admitting that kid. But in terms of the skipping the CBC and maybe even the BNP, uh, BMP, I'm sorry, the CHEM7, the um, basic metabolic panel. If the kid doesn't have any Kawasaki symptoms, they don't have any of the Kawasaki labs positive, they don't have cardiac dysfunction either on their EKG or any abnormality if I add the BMP or any concerns, a gallop, hepatomegaly, anything on my cardiac exam that I find concerning, I might just let that CBC go because a lot of kids with other febrile pathologies are going to have an abnormality in their white count. So Eileen, <laughs> that's so, so much awesome stuff. And our, and our, uh, our uh, board is lighting up with a whole bunch of really excellent questions. So I just wanted to make sure that we uh, get a chance to get some of those in there. You, you, cause you know, you've talked a lot about what to do when the patient arrives in the, in the ED, but one of our actually uh, USC alumni, Ar Armando Clift is asking, uh, He's backing up a minute. He's saying, you know, so much, so many of us are doing uh, um, screening and telemedicine on kids like this. Uh, when should COVID positive kids go to the ED in the first place? Uh, you know, that whole the the the, the thinking process that happens before uh, the arrival in the emergency department, uh, and then we can go back to some of those other issues. Can you address that? It's a great question. You know, like I said, a lot of these kids are going to become symptomatic for the multi-system inflammation. Um, inflammatory syndrome after their initial infection with COVID. So they may not even be positive per PCR. They may not even be symptomatic if they were symptomatic anyway. It's usually two to six weeks out. So if a kid has a little bit of respiratory symptoms, otherwise looks great, no rashes, maybe a tiny amount of GI symptoms, 
and they haven't been persistently febrile, they don't have to run to the emergency department just because they're COVID positive. And in fact, it's probably a bad idea for them to do that. So if you're doing telemedicine, this is really going to be tough to assess over the services available to you via telemedicine. I would say probably asking about the pattern of the fever. This has been defined as any temperature above 38 or even a subjective fever for more than 24 hours. The reality of the situation is most of these kids have a pretty persistent and rather high fever. Ask the parents to just push their finger against the kid's skin and take a look at their capillary refill. If the capillary refill is more than three seconds, then that's somebody that absolutely could be in shock and should go to the emergency department. I would have a low threshold. And like I said, a lot of these kids are having rashes and GI symptoms. So if you've got a good fever going on, a rash and a GI symptom or a GI symptom in a kid that has a history of COVID or is currently COVID positive, I think that's somebody that you would send to the emergency department. I mean, I think a lot of what people are worried about or thinking about is exactly what you've gone over is which patients should we be triggered and say, I need to get the work up. I need to keep them in the hospital. It sounds like we can really fall back on our good EM training. If the kid looks sick, then they should get labs and they should stay in the hospital. If there's multi-system involvement, they should get labs, they should stay in the hospital. So a lot of our good training I think is useful I think the other thing is about return because a lot of the pediatricians offices aren't open. Um, and, and I know you and Saul and, and all of our pediatric colleagues talk about this all the time. When you're worried, have them come back to you, uh, have them revisit the emergency department for a repeat check, which you know, we hate having patients have to come back to the hospital, but sometimes it's the safest thing. One of the other big questions that came across is about age ranges. Are there specific age ranges that seem to be more susceptible to this inflammatory syndrome? Are there certain age groups that seem to be protected from it? Have you, have you seen any patterns with that? There's no age group that's protected from it, but you are correct. It's kind of an interesting epidemiology, right? When we looked at the kids that were initially getting COVID and initially being hospitalized with COVID for the initial phase, the first phase of it, not the multi-system inflammatory syndrome phase, what we saw was primarily a bimodal distribution. We saw a lot of it in infants, and then we saw a lot of it in kids over 15. And I think that that's probably because a lot of that middle group was asymptomatic, and the infants were just being brought in because they had fevers. Most people wouldn't bring their five-year-old in for a temperature of 38. Well, maybe they would, but you know, we hope that they wouldn't, but they certainly are going to bring in their one-month-old. So we were seeing a very bimodal distribution of that. Now that we're looking at the multi-system inflammatory syndrome, kids coming back in or coming in later on, there is no age that's spared. They've reported it everywhere between age one to age 21 years of age. But the peak really seems to be the majority falls within five years to nine years of age, which is kind of interesting because initially this was thought to be a type of Kawasaki disease, maybe comparable with Kawasaki shock syndrome. And the interesting thing is most kids with Kawasaki are a little bit younger kids under five and even kids sort of in that, you know, infant toddler group are overrepresented with Kawasaki disease. So this age difference does seem to be different than what we're seeing with Kawasaki. I mean, another one of the questions that came up is, you know, we keep comparing this with Kawasaki or it's Kawasaki-like. And typically with Kawasaki, you're looking for six, seven days of fever before you even really get triggered but we're not saying that. You're not saying to wait for seven days of fever here before you get triggered. So I know you said it, but let's just say one more time, how many days of fever in a kid coming in would trigger you to say, you know what, that's too many days in this current pandemic and I'm going to get some more testing done. You know, the CDC definition is 24 hours of fever. So I'm obviously not going to pull the trigger on every kid that comes in with 25 hours of fever, but in the right context with the other symptoms in an ill appearing child, I don't think the duration of fever is as important as it is for Kawasaki. I mean, look, with Kawasaki, very, very few kids go into shock. We know that they can have myocardial dysfunction up front. We know that they can have shock up front. That's happening in less than 5% of kids with standard Kawasaki disease. With those kids, we're really worrying about the development of coronary artery aneurysms along the line. And there certainly is an overlap here with Kawasaki. About 15% of kids with the COVID multi-system inflammatory shock syndrome are also getting some coronary artery abnormalities. There are definitely commonalities. 
but over 50% of kids coming in with this multi-system inflammatory shock syndrome are in shock. They're in shock. And that's way different than Kawasaki. It also tends to be refractory to IVIG to a much greater extent than standard Kawasaki. So there's enough of a difference demonstrating that this is a more severe and more acutely severe illness that I don't think we can kind of put it on the back burner and say, well, you've had two days of a fever, come back when it's three or four days and I'll run the Kawasaki labs. We need to be very attentive to the Kawasaki disease findings. The kid comes in with that non-exudative conjunctivitis, the big lymph node in their neck. If they come in with a strawberry tongue or dry cracked lips or the you know inflammatory changes of the hands and the feet, and certainly the rash of Kawasaki, I want you to be worried about those kids but I want you to be more worried about these kids and have a lower threshold for sending a different set of labs, more on the inflammatory marker side, things like ferritin that we're not typically sending for Kawasaki disease that can help you pick out the kids that might be going into shock. We know that most kids with shock don't get hypotensive until very late. The findings can be very subtle, can be a little bit of delayed capillary refill. It can be tachycardia, which is so hard when a kid is crying and febrile in your emergency department to recognize, oh, this is the tachycardic kid with shock versus all the other tachycardic kids. So for the time being, until we know more, I think we have to have a low threshold for relying on labs, which is a paradigm shift for most of us who see tons of kids with fevers in the emergency department and don't necessarily do a lab workup on them. Eileen, mean, thanks for all the updates. We're going to move on to some other stuff, but I think one of the hardest things here, we talk about how little information we have in caring for adults. We have even less information when caring for kids because so few kids are really affected to this degree, and we're just going to have to learn more and more as we go along and see this. One of the big issues that's come up with therapeutics over and over again is about venous thromboembolism and arterial thrombosis as well, clotting everywhere. We were kidding around early in this disease in my shop that it was COVID in a clot, and you just had to find where that clot was because they were there. We had Tom Delory on a couple of weeks ago talking about this, and we've got Tom back to talk about some updates in VTE management. Well, I think the thing we've learned uh, that's new is kind of really how extensive thrombosis is. So there's a you know, many wonderful ICU studies, especially one from the Netherlands I liked, where they prospectively looked and at the end of three weeks, 59% of their ICU patients actually had venous thromboembolism. They would quote like a rate of 2.8% per day. And one thing I liked about the study is they compared it to ward patients and actually COVID patients that were sick enough to go in the ICU had a seven times rate of thrombosis than on the ward. So clearly part of this decompensation cytokine storm is driving this. We're now seeing more autopsy data, again, verifying both macrothrombosis. Uh, there's one of the annals from Germany where you know, unexpected large pulmonary embolism were seen and also microthrombi. Interestingly, as we've suspected in the lungs, but other organs like the brain, maybe not as much as the kidney, which is kind of weird because usually the kidney clots if you look at it the wrong way. So, so a lot of, we're starting now to get a lot of interesting pathologic data. The one story that's still developing is arterial disease. And unfortunately, at least with my perusal of the data, there's not <laughs> been large series, but just in fact, today there was published in the journal Thrombosis and Hemostasis, a review of three patients out of New York, unexpected stroke. And what was disturbing about this and kind of the recurrent theme of the arterial disease is they weren't that sick. They were like, oh, I have a cough and they were tested. And so, you know, some of these deaths, some of these uh, strokes and other things we're seeing actually a manifestation of mild COVID. And the arterial disease can be virulent. There's people reports of clotting off their aorta, clotting off their viscera. And so I think that's a developing story. And again, I think that that may be disturbing because it may be more subtle. Patients may not know they're sick. And many people like myself are also keeping lists of patients that we've seen over the past few months with unexpected thrombosis. If we ever get great antibody testing, maybe they should be tested. You know, the etiology, I think it's very clear that a lot of it's related to this overwhelming inflammation, cytokine storm, uh, more evidence of endothelial infection. When the endothelium gets infected, it becomes very prothrombotic. There's some early reports uh, from people who like to use TAGs that there's fibrinolytic shutdown. And that kind of makes sense of what we see. Because you know, in DIC, 
you get intense clotting, but you get intense fibrinolysis and everything sort of balances. Here we see the clotting and maybe it just doesn't go away and things clot up. And I think one unifying theory that I like is that a lot of it's driven also by the lung infection. You get this intense inflammation around the alveolus, the capillary network starts to thrombose, we thrombose in the lungs, and maybe the, all these very powerful procoagulant proteins shoot out. Therapy, there was an interesting article that got a lot of press that people on pre-existing anticoagulation did better with got COVID. Yesterday in our journal, Blood, what a great name for a journal, there is a propensity controlled study that said that wasn't true. You know, it's like every COVID study, there's 10 that are negative, 10 that are positive. I think we all agree that, you know, if anybody gets sick, they're going to be admitted no matter what, they get profi dose. Although randomized trials are going on, I sense the field is moving more towards if somebody ends up in the ICU, ending up with a double dose and a double dose prophylaxis. The anticoagulation form issued some guidelines recommending that. ISTH said not to uh, the International Society of Thrombosemostasis, but you know, a lot of people, they quoted did and so they wouldn't feel it's bad. And I think it's going there. And I think also we're still at the stage that's so thrombotic that if you have a suspicion, you know, if you can screen for thrombosis, but if not, maybe people suddenly have pulmonary deterioration, D-dimers shoot up, you don't know what's going you know, on, can't get imaging, difficult to image, it's okay to do therapeutic. And most people are recommending with low molecular weight heparin, much less issues with uh, heparin resistance. Outpatient, we're still, if they have risk factors. I've been in the ICU for uh, a month, I'm gonna need a rehab. Probably six weeks of prophylaxis with DOAX or low molecular weight heparin. You know, using TPA, I think most people still feel it's experimental. Uh, Hopefully, randomized trials looking at standard increased dose prophylaxis will get some data from soon. One thing some people have elected to do, some not, we've elected to do because we we've not been that busy, is just simply screening every three to five days if somebody's in the ICU. You know, somebody's in it, knocked out, they're on the ventilator, they're not going to tell you their leg hurts. So, so I think that's my sense in the past month where things are going, what the trends are in COVID coagulopathy. Um, are there ongoing, so there's randomized trials of uh, lower dose for prophylaxis. Are there any trials going on for that sick person in the unit intubated just to anticoagulate them fully? The yes, there are a couple of people also looking at that. Uh, especially the uh, several Italian groups have been fascinated by the idea that heparin itself may have some anti-COVID properties. And so there are studies also looking at that. I've heard that anti-COVID properties thing before. I, <laughs> I know, I know. I, I think Diet Coke has anti-COVID <laughs> properties. That's why I drink it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so um, in the emergency department, then, uh, we're not necessarily anticoagulating all these people. Um, if it looks like they're going to be admitted, though, even just onto the floor, would you start anticoagulation uh, prophylactically with low molecular weight heparin at that stage? Definitely. I think if somebody's sick enough to get admitted, uh, they should be given prophylactic anticoagulation. And I have to wonder if the other side of this, not to add to people's work, is, you know, maybe idiopathic PEs, especially a young person with an idiopathic arterial event, there's probably enough suspicion. If you think it's unusual, you know, it's not a smoker diabetic, uh, that probably they should be screened for COVID because we're starting to see these very mild asymptomatic in, our, in arterial disease. May, may not make much difference in the person's arterial disease, but I think it's something we need more, more uh, understanding of. So lots of great questions that are occurring in the chat. And uh, we've got some faculty in there, Jenny Beck, Ismay, and uh, some of the faculty that you're watching live here are in there answering those questions as we go. Um, we've been hearing a lot about contact tracing and how is that all going to work. And uh, I spoke with Race Vora, who is an ER doc and a toxicologist in Fresno, and classically decided to go in to do some public health work in November, which he says, you know, it's kind of like joining the Navy the day before Pearl Harbor. Um, so it, there was a longer conversation, but I just want to clip in some stuff that I think is really clinically relevant to you about what you should be charting and what you should be telling your patients if you're doing tests and sending them home and they're going to get follow-up appointments or calls. So let's hear what Race has to say about that. What I need from each and every one of you is a hard target search of every gas station, residence, warehouse, barn house, 
hen house, outhouse, and dog house in this area. The name of this fugitive is SARS-CoV-2. Go get him. You know, going back to emergency medicine, whenever you swab someone, take an extra 90 seconds and just tell them what a positive test will mean. Because that's, that's super helpful for us here at Public Health, is if you just give somebody a heads up, like, look, if you are, are positive, no matter how you feel, because chances are you're probably going to discharge them if they feel fine or if they're not that symptomatic. Just say, you know, if your COVID comes back positive, please expect to get a call from public health. Please expect that they're going to instruct you to stay home from work, uh, to stay home at all times unless you have essential needs that you need to fulfill. And also, they're going to ask you where you've been. They're going to ask you about your household contacts. And the reason that they're going to ask you all that stuff is because they're doing contact tracing. And obviously, if you have extra time and you can jot down a few things about their workplace, uh, any birthday parties or funerals or, or beaches that they've been to, um, you know, all, all of those things are really helpful whenever we go back and try to reconstruct exactly what contacts this person might have had. But I understand that that's very time intensive, you know, in a busy emergency department that may not be possible. But those are the kinds of questions. It's not really that foreign to us is in emergency medicine. It's just not something that we focus on automatically. Those are the kinds of questions that contact tracing uh, really involves. You mentioned that I was a toxicologist. That is true. And I've been doing a lot with substance use. So let me just, let me share how I'm thinking about this. Um, you know, given that I, I view the world through this lens of substance use and, and, and toxicology, is that with this quarantine and this lockdown, um, there's obviously a lot of frustration. And the same dynamics that I see playing out um, are actually what you see whenever people are asked to abstain uh, from whatever drugs they like to do. So we basically created an abstinence model uh, with this lockdown. Um, and we basically asked people to stop doing what they love. In this case, it's not heroin, it's just going to the movies, uh, going to get your hair cut, going to do whatever you used to do. But nonetheless, it's the same sort of brain patterns that I see happening is that we basically made America go cold turkey. Um, and, and this abstinence model, while it's very useful um, for the short term, is not sustainable in the long term. Uh, and we know that from substance use. You know, that's why we always say abstinence doesn't work. You have to have a harm reduction model. Uh, people are going to go back, you, you know, and really go back dramatically whenever they relapse. And I think that's kind of the same dynamics that I'm seeing with all of these lockdowns and these shelters in place. And so I think where we need to go with this pandemic is really create like this harm reduction scenario where people can go back and interact and do these social things that they love to do, but doing it in a way that's safe. Race is uh, hysterical at first part of the video. I break up every time. Look, we're still getting a lot of questions about PPE. Uh, Swami, do you want to sort of point us to some resources for that? Yeah, so we did a little review on N95 reuse on Rebel EM. I dropped it into the chat as well. So if you go Rebel EM N95, uh, you'll get all that information, all the different things that you can do, whether it be the vaporized hydrogen peroxide or UV or just time reuse. It's all in there and you can decide what's going to be best for you based on what you've got uh, and systems in place. Yeah, that's Salim's site, and it's fantastic. He's been helping out a lot with our chapter as well, sending us information all the time. Look, we've run out of time uh, almost, but before we go, I want to show you um, another of the Shabam videos. That's uh, the podcast that we do for kids and families, and we did the first season. It was about a pandemic, and I think there are some important lessons to learn from this video. Was the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes COVID-19, built in a lab? Like, was it a genetically engineered bioweapon that was released accidentally on purpose from a virology lab in Wuhan, China? It's all a big cover-up. Well, there's a lot of information out there to sift through if you want some answers. Some of it is actual information, some of it is misinformation, stuff that's wrong, and some of it is disinformation, stuff that's intentionally wrong to make you believe something that's not true. Shabam the Show is all about kids surviving a zombie apocalypse, where we looked at, among other things, how you can determine if something is true or not. So whether we're talking about the existence of zombies or flying humanoids like we did in season one, or theories about the origins of the coronavirus, 
we can use the same tools and steps to sift through information because it can be hard to know what to believe. Anytime someone wants you to believe me, believe something, you should ask, believe me, why? Why should I believe that? So, how do you answer the question, why should I believe this? Believe me. In the show, we proposed a three-step process for sifting through information. And we'll look at that in part two. But before we take those steps, we have to change the way that we think. And to do that, we need a tool. We're going to bust out a thinking tool, which we call our mental truth probability meter. The probability meter works like this. Instead of thinking about the world in binary, where things are either true, the coronavirus is human made, or not true, the coronavirus is natural. Start thinking of things as being on a continuum, where really, really probable is on one end, and really, really not probable or improbable is on the other end. It also means you have to stop using the word impossible. But that's impossible to A true scientist will never rule out something and say, that's impossible, that can't be true, because we don't know. We're still learning about the world. Like Tim Verstein, a neuroscientist that we talked to in episode nine of season one. I'm a scientist, so nothing's impossible. The closest he came to saying impossible was this. It's a very, very low probability of occurring. You can think like this too by switching on your probability meter. You're basically creating a new habit. So when anyone tells you something like X... Instead of saying, is X possible? The question is, is X probable? You're thinking in probabilities. And this is how scientists think because it's useful for adjusting one's thinking based on new information. If new information comes up, the probability can shift either towards less likely or more likely. Thinking in probabilities is also useful because we don't like to think that we're wrong. We don't like to admit that we're wrong. We don't like to realize that we're wrong. Which is, of course, silly, because realizing you're wrong is how we learn what's right, but it still feels bad. When using probabilities, it feels better to change your mind because instead of having to flip from one position to another, True. I believe it. False. I don't believe it. You're just adjusting your probability, leaving it open for it to go back. And by the way, what we didn't mention in the show is that there's a name for this kind of thinking, and it's called Bayesian thinking, based on Thomas Bayes, a Presbyterian minister who was also a statistics guy and had a theorem, and that theorem is central to modern science. So, thinking in probabilities helps you think like a scientist because one, it allows you to easily adjust for new information, and two, it doesn't feel as bad when you change your mind. Now let's use that scientific thinking and apply it to our coronavirus question. First thing we have to do then is change the question so we can think in probabilities. Is it probable that the coronavirus was made in a lab? So here's our question, here's the probability meter, and now we're ready to adjust our thinking based on new information. Now we're ready to process information, and we're gonna do that in part two with our three steps. There's a lot of people that should be watching this video and we'll post it so you can send it out. I think it's really, really important. During these sessions, we've been trying to come back to the science because there's so much uh, disinformation, misinformation. We've got to keep coming back to the science. So I want to thank uh, the crew we had here tonight and the crews we've been having for the last few months. And as I say, we will be back in a month. I think uh, June 30th is the next time we're going to do one of these lives, but we'll be continuing every week to send new information as it comes uh, to light. So uh, be safe out there and we will talk to you all soon. We'll be in the chat room for a while um, answering some more questions, but thank you everybody for coming and thank you for all your work.